Thank you so much. It's great to be here, everyone. As you just heard, my name is Ben Heim. I'm an Australian audiovisual composer and artist. Um, I started my journey in the music world. I went to music school. I learned um, various techniques to write music, to play music, to perform music. And um, I was doing a series of events, actually, funny that, um, in London. And we used to take these these interesting venues. So we would take cathedrals, we would take uh, a, an underground water reservoir one time, all these very unique venues, and we would kit them out with surround sound, sell tickets, and this is when I was very young. I was about 20 when I was doing this. And we would put on these big immersive events. And um, the, the key draw was the, the surround sound and um, contemporary classical compositions that myself and my friends had written. And as we were doing these events, which were very well received, um, I started trying to develop more ways to make the events more immersive, to bring people deeper into the experience, to, um, to create this like multi-sensory, multi-layered experience where people were just swept away with music and sound and vision and lighting all coming together. And so I was a musician and so I had to learn some new skills. And in service of events, I started learning what became my now career in art. Um, I started learning generative techniques. So I want to talk to you a bit about that today. Because um, the, the future, we're really on the brink of a new future here with AI and technology, um, which is really going to empower a new way of, of of creating art, which is what I do, but also for you guys creating events and creating immersive experiences that are multi-layered where the audience can interact with multiple elements of the, the experience, whereas it is through music, screens. The, the technology that we have is, is moving to this paradigm where we're running in real time, where like for human history we've been mostly running on a timeline. We're very used to music that like is a song, any time you can move around the song, but it, it, it's moved from the start till the end. And the same with films, fixed format media. But I want to give you a little peek into the future of what we can do with generative media. So when I say generative, I'm talking about media that updates in real time, is rendered right there on the spot. So I mostly work in visuals and audio, so that's what I'll be mostly telling you about. So it's all rendered in real time. So it's, it's being generated right on the spot by programs. And um, since it's rendered in real time, what you get is the opportunity to connect with it. You get the opportunity to bring other mediums in contact in real time. So what can that be? Well, we can bring in what I, wa what I originally learned it for was to connect visuals and music. So we had these live performances in unique venues with surround sound. and. I wanted to connect the visuals that were happening. We would use projectors often and then lighting. And I wanted to connect those to the music. I wanted the live musicians to be able to perform. And I wanted them to, to feel like the visuals were reacting to them in real time. So that's what I, I learned this for. And that's what I specialize in, is creating these immersive experiences. And I'm going to run through a few of these a bit later. Um, but I want to give you a preview of some other things that uh, you can do with that too. So uh, something that I'm often called upon to do these days is integrate data into these uh, immersive experiences. So I will take a web API and maybe we're bringing in the weather and having a sculpture that reacts to the weather. Or we're bringing in data from a company. So maybe uh, I'm working on a healthcare project uh, right now where we're taking experiences that people have with this healthcare company, be it uh, visits to an emergency room or babies being delivered or surgeries being performed and creating a generative artwork that like displays this in a in a beautiful way it's a sort of a watercolor piece that I'm working on for that uh, what else can we bring in um, interaction interaction is a big thing you can have people connecting with these experiences and I've got two examples that I'll show you later of how I'm working with interfaces where audiences can come and interact with visuals, interact with audio, and that can deepen their immersion. They can, they can get really carried away in the experience and feel like they're a part of it. So instead of just watching a film where you feel like you're sitting, you're watching a creation somebody else has made, 
with generative real-time techniques, we can bring them, the audience, that is, into these experiences and uh, have them feel like they're really a part of things. And I do this in a variety of fashions. Often it's using touch screens so they can move elements of the visuals around. Sometimes I use depth cameras so we can sense people. We can add their movements into an interactive audio piece or an interactive visual piece. Um, and then various other controls. You can have joysticks, buttons. I did a project in um, Iceland on the Harper Concert Hall. I don't know if any of you know this. There's this beautiful concert hall in Iceland with a, um, I think it was designed by Olafur Eliasson. I, you might have to fact check me on that one. But um, the, the whole facade of this concert hall is, is this honeycomb LED light sculpture. And I did a project there where we were we had set up a joystick and, a, uh, and a, a set of buttons, and the audience could actually like trigger moving lights across the surface of this uh, concert hall. It was very great, and they, that produced audio as well. Um, so I'm going to jump into some examples of some, if we just move to the next slide. So these are, these are some of my artworks. Um, so I'm just going to give you a general idea of what my art looks like. It's very detailed. I use a variety of techniques to create these things um, using AI and generative techniques. So I want to give you a little understanding of what I say when I mean generative and then how that relates to AI. Because generative art is, is a really new movement in art. And this is going to get into the bit more arty side of things right now. We'll bring it back to events in a second. But um, it's, a, it's a concept that I, I find people uh, often get confused by. Because this is a new way of creating art that we haven't been able to do in human history until now. So if you imagine how a tree is formed, it, is, it has a genetic code. And, it ha and that code contains a set of rules which then determines how the tree grows. It has a program to, within it, uh, a natural program, that determines how branches are formed, how leaves are formed, how the energy systems inside the tree convert sunlight into energy for the tree. And this is all contained within the tree's genetic code. And then the tree interacts with its environment. So the tree grows up based on this genetic code, and then the genetic code has has coding in it that determines how it reacts to its environment. And so you see things like the way the wind is, where that tree is, is growing, will affect the shape of the tree. And this is all a generative process. So nobody is there picking branches out and putting them into place. They're everybody, the, all, the, all the information is contained within the genetic code and it reacts to the circumstances around it, and it forms a beautiful tree, which we could consider an artwork. And so this is sort of an example of how generative artists work. We come up with rules and systems and equations and maths functions and all sorts of things which we code into software, and then these, these, uh, these rules all go together to form art that is generated in real time. And then our real-time art, much like the tree I was talking about before, gets influenced by the, any kind of uh, environment around it, depending on how we code it. And, and that's where all these interactions come in. If you bring in the way that people interact with it, it can generate different art. If you bring in data, the data is directly informing how the piece is created. And this is how I end up with these artworks which are constantly generating themselves. So it's a, it's a different way of working. Like I can't determine exactly how these artworks are going to turn out. But I can set up rules so I can say, these colors are going to come up at this point. Or over a certain period of time, different colors are going to uh, appear at different times. And then I sort of just let the computer run, and it creates these artworks. And this, this is a really new and interesting way to create, because we've never been able to do this in human history until we invented computers. And then even more recently, in the past 10 years, the power that graphics cards um, have developed allow us to, to, to do these kind of artworks. 
And if you start to think about how the natural world works, how clouds are formed, how oceans move, how waves are formed, how even animals are formed, these are all generative processes with rules and systems coming together to create a huge variety of very beautiful things in the, in the natural world. And we're just starting to tap into that potential. And so a subset of that generative like paradigm is AI. And AI is an incredibly useful tool that I have used on many, many occasions. We're going to go over two examples of that soon. Um, but it is an incredible tool that allows these generative techniques to even take on an own, a life of their own. So um, while a lot of my systems that I create have very clear rules, that often results in a very basic artwork. Like if I'm just saying yellow will appear in 10 minutes, then red, you can see that it, layering complexity, you can create a quite complex artwork, but you can't really capture the complexity of a tree, which has, is almost infinitely complex. And that's where AI comes in. There's a variety of different new AI techniques that we're just developing that empower this generative paradigm. So we could create an AI that is, is really great at creating different cats, like say images of cats, and it's trained on a data set of cats, and then it generates more cats. And, and this, if you, if you just think about this tool, it's a, it's a really incredible tool to be able to just define a, a data set that you want more of and create infinite var variations on that. And with infinite levels of detail too, as we can keep uh, improving the technology. So I think I've probably talked for a little too much on this, um, but let's jump into some examples um, because it's, it's probably easier for you to, to connect in that way. Let's jump into, if we could jump to the next slide, please. All right, so this is one of the first projects that I did with AI. And this is a really great example of a generative AI and how we can connect it to a real-time event. So this is a project with the, it's called Other Worlds, and I created it in conjunction with the London Contemporary Orchestra and a bunch of AI re researchers from Rutgers University, actually. So the, the plan was to make a, when I was brought up on board, was to make a performance where we're taking the live sound from the orchestra as they perform in the Barbican Hall in London and translate that into visuals, into, a, into an experience and and so we, we contacted some AI researchers and said, how can we do this? What, what methods, what, what tricks have you guys been working on? What research have you been doing that can uh, determine this? And we went through a variety of different methods. Um, the original plan was for me to create a audio reactive generative work and then to retexture that using AI. But we also, but we stumbled upon a uh, a really early version of the kind of generative AIs that you see, like DALI and uh, Stable Diffusion. You might have seen all of these swirls uh, of like cities that become swirls or logos. So these are generative AIs, also called GANs. And this is a really early version of a GAN. And we actually trained it ourselves. So uh, those stable diffusion and, and all the current ones that you see are trained on extensive data sets of almost all images on the internet are fed into these things. Whether that is ethical or not, we don't know, but um, <laughs> we're not gonna <laughs> jump into that debate. So we trained our, cell, our own AI, and it was really good at creating pictures of volcanoes, really good at creating pictures of caves, and really good at creating pictures of seas. Um, so, so like we took like lots of images of these these three different categories and fed them into the AI and it became really great at learning how to make these images. And then now we're going to get into a slightly complex part but I'm going to go through it quickly and then get to the main point. So when an AI is trained you you create what is called vector space which is a, a normal vector is like say a directional vector where you've got left, right, up, down, at, defined as, as integer values. But AI works in multi-dimensional space where you have a, like 100 dimensions. And it can, you can move through this space, which is called dreaming. Moving through vector space with an AI is the AI dreaming. 
And so when we trained the AI, we found the dreaming, which is it just generating random images by walking through these multiple vectors. Um, it was creating really beautiful images. And so we determined that we could create a method where the audio could push this little dot through vector space, and it would move through vector space depending on what audio frequency bands were lighting up. So this resulted in this amazing performance. We were projecting on a scrim in front of the orchestra, and we were pushing this little vec this dot through vector space, and it was generating all these images based on the live sounds of the orchestra. And I was literally there with a mixing desk because uh, the thing that the AI wasn't good at was human perception. So when you're listening to an orchestra performing, um, you hear things in a different way to the, how a computer hears things. And so um, what I was doing was I, was I had all the faders from all the different microphones for the orchestra, and I was pushing up the violins when there was a violin solo, pushing up the percussion when there was a percussion solo, and pushing up the brass when the brass were coming in, and to really make sure that the AI was interpreting the part of the performance that was most relevant to human perception. So let's just play this video and we can have a look at how this performance turned out. Let's just mute that, and then you can leave it playing so people can have a look. But um, yeah, we'll keep the volume down. So you can see, it creates a very dynamic experience. And I might be a bit biased on this, but I very much love experiences where audio and visuals are, are connected. It happens to be what I do. Oh, here's, here's some of the cave. I think that was the volcano stuff that you heard earlier, and these are the cave footage. Um, what I'm noticing right now is how low resolution this was. This was about four years ago, so this is really in the early stages of um, AI, and, and it, I think it'd be really great to revisit this uh, with the kind of modern capabilities, because we were rendering, I don't know, like 256 pixels by 256 pixels. It was really tiny. Here's some of the, um, the water, the ocean, ocean visuals. Um, there was a great time, I don't know if it's in this video, where it was creating all these like kelp forests, uh, like underwater kelp forests. Um, so let's just move on to the, the next experience that I have queued up. Okay, so this is uh, a different type of AI that I really want to uh, get you understanding, because this is uh, a performance that I did with an artist called Anna Riddler. And she is somewhat of a pioneer in the AI space. Um, she will definitely be one of the, the people that go down in the history books in the art movements for her work in pushing AI art forward. So convolutional neural networks, they take an input of an image and then they tell you what it is uh, based on how you've trained these AIs. And, and it's a very interesting thing to use from an artistic standpoint because it is constantly categorizing things. And so something I like to do with convolutional neural networks is train them on one thing and then point them at another thing. So maybe train them on altercations and riots and then point them at the ocean and tell us, like, have it tell you what kind of altercation is going on in the ocean. But um, what we were doing here was using charcoal drawing to, uh, to be converted directly into sound by using a convolutional AI network. So what you're gonna see in this performance is Anna has a pair of glasses on which have a camera on them and she is drawing and we have trained this convolutional network on a series of charcoal lines. So individual strokes, uh, like a single line or a curved line or a vertical line or a circle and then the AI is, is determining what she's drawing. And this is very interesting 
uh, because all these lines interact. And so the AI is trying to determine which line is, is happening, and as she looks around, it'll determine different lines in different areas. And, um, and so the, um, then I am taking the output from these, these AI, and I am connecting it to a soprano sample, uh, so a, a singer that I have sampled, and each of these lines has a different sound and a different effect that goes along with it, and it all works together to create a very interesting texture that is real-time sonifying her drawing. So let's have this video play. Sort of fits with the music. It's in the right key. interesting as she like moves further and way and closer it, it determines different different strokes all right we can just uh, mute that and and move on so I want to move into the next portion of my talk which is to discuss how we can empower audiences through interactivity and I think this is a really powerful thing that is going to become a huge part of our culture as we move forward. So um, we're moving into this world where films uh, are currently the, the main form of visual entertainment. But in the future, I really believe that virtual reality and those kind of experiences, fully immersive experiences, um, will be the standard because um, as technology improves, we're getting the ability to render in real time at very high fidelity, and it won't be long before we have photorealistic virtual reality. And virtual reality, by its nature of its essence, has to be real time rendered, because you have to be able to interact and move around a scene. And I, I believe this will be a big driving factor towards um, a world where real time graphics take the, the main stage over um, graphics that are generated in a fixed format, so just straight video creation. So if we move on to the next slide, um, we've got an example of a project that I'm currently working on, which is, uh, this is like a little preview of an installation that I'll be doing in January, working with NASA and the James Webb Space Telescope to, to create a, an immersive installation, an immersive interactive installation where audiences can explore the data that comes off the IR camera of the James Webb Space Telescope, and they can explore how this, this telescope tells us about some of the oldest stars that we've ever seen, because the James Webb Space Telescope is a, a really amazing technological marvel in that it can see further than we've ever seen before, and that means it can see further into the past than we've ever seen before. And so this is an example of how you can bring audiences into an experience through interactive generative techniques. So here we have, uh, in this example, we have two, two uh, images of the same galaxy cluster. This is Pandora's cluster, 
which is a, an, an amazing galaxy cluster that was formed of hu two huge galaxy clusters colliding together and releasing all of these gases and nebula, and it makes for a very interesting subject. Um, so something that we are trying to do with this project is to get the audiences to experience what it's like to discover space through a space telescope. So um, when we get data from a space telescope, it tells us lots of different things. Different frequency bands of light tell us different things about the matter that is in an area. So for example, in this example, we've got on the left, this is the James Webb Space Telescope NearCam, which is an infrared camera. And then on the other side here, we have the Chandra X-ray camera, which is um, obviously it is detecting and picking up X-rays coming from this galaxy cluster. And so I always use this example of, um, of how X-rays mean that whenever there is something giving off X-rays, it means that there is an area of super hot plasma that is invisible to us, but it is burning in the X-ray light spectrum, so far beyond what we can see. And it gives off this X-ray heat, and, and it's very interesting because it is like this super hot matter that we can't even see, and, it, and, it's, and it's huge and dense, and you can see this huge cloud of a super hot plasma. And it's sort of hard to, do, to understand that there is this, this immense source of matter in our universe that we can't even see. And so this is why we're taking people into the experience by sonifying the data and allowing people to interact. So people can interact with this. This, this is a touch screen at the bottom here. And as they touch the screen and move through these two images, they can hear the IR, the IR on this side um, determining the pitch of a bass note and the X-ray data coming in. So let's just play the video and you can see how that's happening. So you can hear the higher sounds of the, uh, the X-rays and the lower sounds of the infrared. So let's just uh, bring the volume down on that so I can uh, talk a little bit. So yeah, you can see the example of uh, how we are allowing um, people to really explore the data for themselves. Something that we're trying to say is that people can do science, like literally do science for themselves, taking the data, exploring it, and, um, and being able to do real science, discover things within this data just in the same way a scientist would do. And if you think about all events, there, there are so many opportunities to bring audiences into these experiences, to allow them to interact with whatever you've got going on, um, to, whereas it's a data source, whether it's a, um, themselves just interacting with some light or some sound. So let's just move on to one final example. Um, so, so this is sort of my own project, and, and this is something that I work on um, just for myself, for my art practice. And it's just a interactive generative painting. So it is a painting that is constantly generating itself, generating variations of itself, but then will react to anybody that walks in front of it. it and they will be able to interact with the painting and see their movements reflected in the painting, see the art change in relation to what they do. So let's just play this and we'll have a look at that.
the painting itself is constantly creating variations um, and it would keep creating those variations even without the human interaction but um, with the human interaction you get to be part of the painting too. So that is about all I have for you today but um, Eventbrite have been gracious enough to bring in uh, some interactive art to show you today. So I'm going to get everybody to move into the main space and we have an interactive art experience that we're going to be showing there. Uh, with the <laughs> Perfect.